the Radio Forest Podcast. With the recent passing of Meatloaf, here's an interview I did with him back in 2011 when he was promoting his new album, Hell in a Handbasket. Rest in peace, Meat. Ah, cool, Forrest. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. Loosen your voice a little bit, huh? Yeah, well, I've been, <laughs> I've, I've been, I've been getting up every morning here in California at five thirty, and and uh, getting on the radio and and talking all day. So you're not uh, not nineteen anymore, right? Uh, wait a <laughs> second. Wait, wait, wait. Let me think. Did I? Was I 19 or 20 on my last birthday? <laughs> um, you know, you just start, and when you get older, you lose count. Well, I know back in the day, man, you just just the interview and tour and TV shows and movies. Have you slowed down at all, to be honest? No. No. Is it getting harder to keep up that pace? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been going, uh, and listen, listen, seriously. Uh-huh. We finished Hank Cool Teddy Bear, and I went out on a promo tour. And I went everywhere, and we came back, and we went in rehearsals. I did a movie in South Carolina. I did a movie in another state. We went in rehearsals. I went on tour. Uh, I did that crazy show, Celebrity Apprentice, which yeah. was really hard work. Four days after that show finished taping, I was on stage in the U.K. in London, Wembley Arena. We did that. We came back. We took a few weeks off. We started touring again. When we started touring again, I decided I wanted to make this record. So we started making this record on the bus, in hotel rooms, in backstage, doing vocals in closets. I w- went to Nashville for a couple of weeks and sat down with five different writers. People are under the assumption, some people, that people just send me songs and I record them. That's the biggest load of cow manure that you can possibly get. Because what I don't do is I'm not one of those egomaniacs that say, well, if you want me to record your song, I have to have my name on as a writer. I'm involved in the writing process and in the process of putting the songs together on almost every song and have been on every album, including Bat, with the exception of For Crying Out Loud which is on bat, which Jim wrote, which I had nothing to do with other than wanting to go to the high note at the end is an artistic choice. So in order for you to, to push out the newest one, Hell in a Handbasket, since Teddy Bear, with having no time and doing it, like you said, on the road, hotel rooms, in closets, is that something that you had to do? I didn't, there wasn't no, you know, there was no contract. It was something personal, and this album is personal. And it was something that I had to do because I've been walking around this world for the last six years hearing the most insane stuff. I mean, I watch um, Anderson Cooper, Chris Matthews, Bill O'Reilly, and Sean Hannity's a friend of mine. And so I'm schizophrenic, okay? Let's just face facts. I'm neither Republican. I'm neither Democrat. I've worked both sides of, of those things. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I'm I'm almost a libertarian, I think. I like Ram, Ron Paul, except this, we're going to talk politics, or, except his foreign policy is, is, is nightmarish. Yeah, a little scary. And it's, it, yeah, he's a bit frightening. Uh, but I, I just chalk it up to his age. But it was something, because I walk around and say, the world's gone to hell in a handbasket, because people have stopped caring about other people. We've lost our humanity. People going into schools and shooting people, bullying on social networks. If you read an article on the Internet and you want to make a comment that is not harsh, that is not hateful, that is just an opinion, say, you know, Harry, I don't agree with that opinion. I think maybe if you thought it over, you might look at it a different way. That's not putting Harry down. That's just making a comment. Well, if you read on down the page, next thing you know, they're calling, you know. I mean, poor Adele had a problem with her vocal cord. It started off as very compassionate and wound up with, well, she's fat anyway. Talking about Adele. Whitney Houston passes away. I'm reading articles because I I didn't know Whitney that well, but I'd sit with her in England and had a 45-minute conversation. 
And she's only one of four musicians I've ever had a conversation with for that long. And they include Bon Jovi, Sting, Roger Daltrey, and Whitney Houston. Wow. Because I don't speak musician. I speak actor. It's who you are internally. Internally, for me, it's all the same. Because it's about, in acting, acting is about reacting and finding the truth. Live shows are about reacting and telling the truth to the audience. Not going and blowing kisses and giving high fives and pointing to the audience and going, Hey, Jersey, we love you. Oh, that's just jerk-off time. <laughs> so cliched. I, my band, I tell them from the day one, from 1977 to this day, if I ever see anybody put your hands above your head and tell the audience to clap, <laughs> you'll be fired on the spot. <laughs> Good, thank you. I mean, I, the other night on Jay Leno, I did Jay Leno with the Ricky Minor Band, and when I see him back on TV, they're doing it behind me. I couldn't fire him. And they're doing it behind me. And, and uh, you know, I went, well, it's okay. It's on TV. But it did make me a little crazy. And I, that song the other day, I'd never sung live in my life. Was that Giving Tree? Was, giving Tree. Never sung it. It was like the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I would sing it one time at 1 o'clock. What film do you think you're probably most recognized from? You've been in a couple of big ones, Rocky Horror, Fight Club, Pick of Destiny. Which one do you think your fans recognize you most as, as Meatloaf the actor? You know, I've done 57 films, and if I walk through airports, you'd be absolutely surprised what people talk. They talk to me about every, pretty much every film, except for Wayne's World and Spice Girls. <laughs> I forgot you were in Spice Girls. Yeah, well, I try to forget that, too. <laughs> the Wayne's World and Spice Girls don't count in my film collection. But you'd be surprised. People will talk to me about the movie I did with Bill Macy and Laura Dern that was written by Arthur Miller called Focus. They'll talk to me about, oh, some, you know, crazy movie I did where I was a serial killer. They talk to me about Fight Club, uh, Rocky, probably Rocky Horror more than any. I want to know what my favorite thing about Rocky Horror was. And I said, <laughs> looking at, it's 1971, watching Susan Sarandon run around in bra and panties all the time. You know, I never even thought about that. That's awesome. Yeah, well, you should have. Now I'm thinking about it. you got to figure out how young she was. And she's a lovely lady. And she wouldn't mind me at all bragging about her bra and panties. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your son-in-law, Scott Ian from Anthrax. How's that work out with the family? you got a bunch of musicians together now. Uh, yeah, that's good. We... we um, uh, Pearl and him had a baby named Revel, and he's the one who got me with Chuck D in this record. You got Chuck D and Little John. I actually was wondering how you got them, so that was through Scott? Uh, well, Little John I got through um, knowing Little John on Celebrity Apprentice, but Chuck D I got through Scott. Well, what happened was I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't own rap records. I didn't, I would never say to you, I didn't own disco records, but I would never utter the words, oh, I hate disco, or I don't, I, I hate rap. I would just go, mm, it's not something I'm into. Well, after meeting Lil John, I wanted to know about the artistic value of it. And if you look at my iTunes now, people, somebody saw my iTunes the other day, and they went, how much rap do you have on there? <laughs> You're getting into it now. Oh, I'm really into it. I was on a plane the other day, and I, you know, I, I'm 64, and I know people were passing me by going, Oh, I bet he's listening to Peter, Paul, and Mary, <laughs> N NWA. I just started to understand the art form, and when it came time for, like, Mad Mad World, I'm sitting and I, 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 listen, I analyze everything to death, and I said, artistically, this is what we need. Emotionally and dramatically, we need this, and we need somebody that does it for real. When they do it, they're telling you the truth. Because everything with me, artistically, whether it's a film, whether it's a play, whether it's a show, whether it's a record, it's about the truth. It's not about... And, and I'm sorry, I've heard some records that have come out in the last two weeks that, ha, that are about what people, they think people want to hear is the truth, not what is the truth. And it's making me, again, crazy. The world's gone to hell in a handbasket. They're lying. They're lying to themselves, and they're, they're just waving the flag and saying, 
oh, this is what you want to hear, and it drives me crazy. When I'm doing a record, I don't sit in a room and go, okay, I think my audience wants to hear this. I don't do it. I, you know, my audience either likes the records or they don't like them. You know what? I want to hear this. I want this to be the truth. And if I deliver the truth, I'm hopeful that the audience will understand what I'm doing and, and like it as well. So with Hell in a Handbasket, and you're saying that this is a very personal record, is it personal like the feelings that Mead has, or is it more, yes. of, of more of your feelings of the world? It's about how I feel about the world. There's too many people out there telling you what the world thinks. I can only comment on what I see in the world and how I feel about the world. I can't tell you how you feel about the world. I have a good idea, but I can't sit there and actually say that my truth is your truth. I don't preach. I do it through metaphors. And I do it through things like California Dreaming, which some reviewer the other day said, uh, oh, how could he ruin such a beautiful little song? And I went, how old are you, 13? And do you ever read? Do you research? Did you take journalism? Did you take English, literary? Did you read the classics? Have you ever studied? Because if you read California Dreaming, the guy never goes to California because the fear of failure holds him back. So that's why you decided to cover it. Yes. Because I always thought it was a happy song about some guy wanting to go to California to watch the girls in bikinis on yeah, the beach. Yeah, that's what it would, like you would the think. the Beach Boys or Van Halen. But right away, the first line of the song, you know what I mean? All oh, the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. Yeah, this is a sad song. This is serious. Yeah, and if John Phillips was alive, I guarantee you, I would bet you $2 Canadian, and that's nothing against Canadian because $2 is worth more than $2 American now. He would agree with me. And in fact, Lou Adler, who's a really good friend of mine for, what, almost 40 years, produced that record. And I will next week get him on the phone and send him a copy and say, tell me, what did John have in mind when he wrote this? Because I think this is what it is. I would be willing to bet that Lou says, you're right. Everybody's always taken it as this nice little happy little melody pop song. It's got a great melody. I mean, it's a pretty melody. And they did it as a pretty melody, and they did it as a happy track. And people do that all the time. They will put dark tracks against happy songs. It's an art. Sometimes we decide to do it as well. We'll take a happy song and make a, a dark track behind it. But this one, we immediately came with a dark track. We came with darker drums than the rest of the album, and the drums are darker. You know, all of me is about me. It's a confessional about me. So. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm not, I'm not preaching to the audience. I'm saying, look, I'm as guilty as everyone else. Now, I need to change who I am, and I'm hoping that we can all change who we are and become better people. Because my mantra, and has been for the last 10 years, is today I want to get up and learn something new, and I want to be a better person today than I was yesterday. Once again, we're talking to Meatloaf, new album out now called Hell in a Handbasket. Website, meatloaf.net, Facebook, Meatloaf, and Twitter, Real Meatloaf. Meatloaf, thanks for hanging out with us today, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, listen, thank you for talking to me. Are you kidding? I've been doing this for 46 years, so anytime people want to talk to me, I'm so grateful. It's unbelievable.